So what's the difference between ultraviolet disinfection and chlorine disinfection? Ultraviolet disinfection has no chemicals in it. It's a, it's a bright UV light. And it has a, a intensity, in it and, but that deactivates an organism. It doesn't kill it. It just deactivates it, and so it can't reproduce. Whereas a chlorine, that oxidizes the microorganism. It actually breaks the cells open, and that kills them. There are other um, differences as well. The ultraviolet light is just a one-shot deal. It disinfects the, the microorganisms as they pass through the unit. After that, the water can get recontaminated. Whereas the chlorine, was, um, chlorine, as long as there is a chlorine residual, will keep on killing. Is one method better than another? Chlorine has the edge over ultraviolet light, and that's because of the microorganisms you're trying to inactivate and kill. Uh, there's three families, if you like. One's, one's protozoa. They're, they're a hard shell that comes predominantly from um, cattle, the gut of warm-blooded animals. You've got your bacteria, which everyone's familiar with, and then you get into the viruses. And ultraviolet light is good at your protozoa and your bacteria. Viruses, uh, research is out. It's put a bit on the bubble. Some it does, some it doesn't. And at the normal intensity you get in drinking water, um, it won't do most viruses. Whereas chlorine, uh, there's one protozoa, which is the hard shell, the larger organism, which you don't normally get in groundwater, um, that, that chlorine won't touch. But everything else, including viruses, chlorine will kill. It sounds like uh, if you have both, it, it, it widens the spectrum of, of disinfection. It makes it, it makes it broader. Ah, you're starting to get into multi-barrier questions now. What exactly does a multi-barrier approach look like? And uh, why do councils have to use that? Um, it's, it's a risk management tool that, that water utilities have. That during the Hadlock North inquiry, a multi-barrier was often referred to as the Swiss cheese approach and that you can have multiple barriers there, and it's hard for um, the more barriers you have, the harder it is for a contamination to get through all the barriers to um, make a community ill. Right, so that then makes sense to have UV to treat the ones uh, as they pass through, and the ones that remain in the system, the chlorine can kind of take care of those. People need to think of the chlorine as one of the last last barriers that are there. It's like the, it's like the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. So there are many types of barrier protections that are out there. One's your source water protection, making sure that events that happen in the water source aren't, uh, can't have peaks that are, exceed the capability of the treatment plant processes. It's having more than one treatment plant process, so if one fails, the other one's there to protect it and the community's still safe to spread the water. And it's also having a secure distribution network that that contamination can't enter in even post-treatment. So we need that ambulance at the bottom of the cliff to last a long time. Is that what residual chlorination is? Yes, it is. It's, a, it's having a chlorine residual that goes all the way through from the treatment plant right through to the customer's tap. Water, the, the networks in New Zealand, they leak. Uh, it's, the average is about 20% of the water that actually doesn't make it there. Now, some of those leaks are in the homeowner's property, some are in the network's property. But the problem is whenever there's a loss of pressure in the network with those leaky pipes, water can actually leak in. And so groundwater or surface water can then contaminate it, and that will have pathogens and microorganisms in it. And having a chlorine residual protects from majority of all those reasons. Right. So how do you actually achieve residual chlorine in the network? It's just by having a dose rate such that the demand on the water from um, contamination is such that there's a little bit free at the very end. For more information, including the consultation document and supporting information, head to tasman.govt.nz forward slash feedback. Consultation closes Friday, September 4.